Thank you very much. Um, thank you for being here and for your interest. So it is the subject of my talk. But before going into that, I, I would like to first uh, state a very general problem. So start with two locally compact groups, H and G, with H as a subgroup of G. Then, of course, we may form the quotient G, G over H, on which G acts on the right. And I assume more over than X uh, is equipped with a G invariant measure. Then you can form the L2 space of X, and you have a natural unitary reaction of G on that Hilbert space. I denote it by R. So it's what we call the unitary representation. And then you may ask the following very natural question. What is the decomposition of this representation in terms of irreducible representation? So th this question is very broad and general, and it's very difficult in general to handle it. But I will focus on the particular case of arithmetic interest, namely when G and H are what we call reductive periodic groups. So this means that the following, you have a periodic field F, that, that is a finite extension of QP, and two reductive algebraic groups, bold H and bold G, such that G and H are the F points of these reductive algebraic groups. So reductive algebraic groups are some particular kind of algebraic groups and so here you have some examples of reductive algebraic groups. So you may think of GLN, for example. So this is the group of n by n invertible matrices. Or SLN, or even special orthogonal groups or unitary groups are reductive groups. So if you don't know what a reductive group is in general, you may think of one of these examples. So now if you want to address the above question for in this particular case, uh, you need at least a way to talk about the irreducible representations of G. I mean, you need to know what they are or something to give them names. Or in other words, you need a parametrization of them. And such a parametrization is provided by the local Langlands correspondence, which roughly goes like that. You have a correspondence between the set of irreducible representations of G and some sort of parameters called the Langlands parameters. And before telling you what the Langlands parameter is, let me emphasize first one main point. So in the definition of G, you have two main ingredients. So first you have the algebraic group ball G, and of course you have also the field F. And these two ingredients are put together in the definition of G in some sense. And Langlands parameter is going uh, in some sense, to pull apart these two ingredients. So namely, Langlands parameter is something like that. So that's an homomorphism from one group to another group. The first group, W prime of F, is what we call the weyl group. And all you need to know about it is that it only depends on the field F and that it's closely related to the absolute Galois group of F. So this part of a Langlands parameter will carry the information from the field F. And the other part, L of ball G, uh, is what we call the Langlands dual group of G, or just dual group of G, of ball G. And so it's a complex group, which is defined only in terms of the algebraic group ball G. And there is precise VCP to uh, get the dual group starting from ball G. So here are two examples. For example, the Langlands dual of GLN is simply GLN of C whereas the Langlands dual group of SLN is PGLN of C. And so now that you know what the Langlands parameter is, I may precise a little bit what should say the local Langlands correspondence. So more precisely, there should be a map that associates to every Langlands parameter not quite a single irreducible representation of G, but rather a finite set of them called L packets. So I didn't know the map that phi maps to pi phi. And of course, this map has to satisfy a certain number of expected properties. So for example, the L packets should give you a partition of the set of irreducible representations of G. And the correspondence should also be compatible to a certain number of arithmetic invariants that you can define on both sides. And this correspondence, the lo local Langlands correspondence, is still a conjecture in general, but at least now it's known in some cases. 
So first of all, by the work of Aristel and Enya, it's no, now known for GLN. And then recently, Arthur succeeded in extending the correspondence to spatial orthogonal and symplectic groups. And then even more recently, a bunch of people, you see the name there, uh, using the ideas of R2, extending further the correspondence to unicellular groups. So now that we know at least the local Langlands correspondence for these groups, we have a way to talk about the irreducible representations of G. And we may return to our initial problem. And I will now assume that X is spherical. So this is, that this is a spherical variety. And I won't tell you what it means, but it tells, some, it tells you something like X is not too big. But here are a few examples of spherical varieties. So for example, you may take H to be GLN times GLM and the group G to be GLN plus M or here you have two other examples of spherical varieties. And starting from such a spherical variety, uh, Sakharidis and Venkatesh were able to construct, in many cases, a dual group associated to this spherical variety. So this is the group denoted by L ball GX. And together with an homomorphism not quite from the dual group of X to the dual group of G, but rather from the product of the dual group of X with SL2C to the dual group of G. And they use this construction to give a conjecture about the decomposition of the L2 space of X. So, but I, I will assume now that the SL2 factor in the above homomorphism is trivial, because otherwise we need to uh, use another notion of packet called outer packets. But as you see, if the SL2 factor there, so meaning that the homomorphism above when restricted to SL2C is trivial, if this factor is trivial, then you may just compose Langlands parameter landing into the dual group of X to get a Langlands parameter landing in the dual group of G. So in other words, a, Lang Lang a Langlands parameter for G. So this maps I denote it by phi goes to phi prime. And now in this particular case, so still when the SL2 factor is trivial, they secondly disinvocated gave the following conjecture, namely that there should be a decomposition of this big representation of L2 of X into a direct integral decomposition uh, of G representations H phi prime. So here the phi runs over the Langlands parameters uh, landing in the dual group of X. And phi prime is the Langlands parameter of G associated to phi as above. And this, um, representation H phi prime should be a multiplicity free sum of representations uh, belonging to the L packets associated to phi prime. So not that this conjecture doesn't say that this representation, this space H phi prime is not zero, but at least it gives you some indication of which representations may appear in the decomposition of L2 of X. So this conjecture may be seen as part of some sort of local relative Langlands program. And now I would like to talk about a tool that we have to attack such a conjecture, namely trace formulas. So what is a trace formula? So we have to go back to our representation L2 of X. And instead of letting just the group act on that space, you may extend the action to some space of function on G. So for example, you may take a continuous function on G, F, and define an operator from F by just convolution of the white on this space of function. So uh, you get an operator R of F. And actually, this operator is given by a kernel uh, there, KF of X, Y. So it's a function of two variables, X and Y, living in X. And this means that the action of R of F on a function phi is given by integration of the kernel against phi. So this is some sort of saying that R of F is given by an infinite dimensional matrix whose entries are the KF of X and Y. So now what you want to do with such an operator is try to compute its trace. The trouble is that in general this space L2 of X is of course of infinite dimension and so you need this, this is not clear if this operator will have a trace. But for example, if the <coughs> space L2 of X decomposes discreetly in irreducible representations, so this means that 
this is isomorphic to an Hilbertian direct sum of some uh, reducible representation pi with multiplicity m of pi, then r of f is indeed of trace class. And in fact, you have two ways to compute its trace. So first of all, you may just use this decomposition there to get that the trace of r of f is the sum over the pi of m of pi times the trace of pi of f. But on the other hand, you can also use the fact that r of f is given by a kernel operator. And as I said, it's like an infinite dimensional matrix. And as you know, the trace of a matrix is the sum of the element of the diagonal. So this gives you that the trace of r of f is the integral over the diagonal of the kernel. And it's not hard to transform this expression into an integral of a, this is a space of conjugacy classes in H of something that is called the orbital integral. So I H of F is the orbital integral, is just the integral of F over the conjugacy class of H. And um, so now what, what, what you got is an identity between two distributions. So on the left there, you have a distribution involving uh, the trace of the pi, so these are called the characters. And on the right hand side there, you have a distribution involving orbital integrals. So this is the general feature of a trace formula. You have an identity between the spectral side there and a geometric side there. So I, as I said, the trouble is in general is that you don't know that R of f is of trace class, and uh, actually in general it's not. Then what we should do is following an idea of R2. We, a simple idea of R2, we should just truncate the trace. So instead of just summing the coefficients over the diagonal, we should just sum the coefficients over the diagonal belonging to some compact subset of it. So I define a truncated trace, G JT of F, to be the integral over the diagonal of the kernel times this u of t is the characteristic function of some, say, big compact subset of x, omega t. And so now you have a parameter t there. And for example, you would like the compact subsets omega t to increase and cover uh, the wall space x as x as t goes to infinity in some sense. And now you want to do exactly the same as before. So you would like to evaluate this truncated trace as t goes to infinity in two different ways. So one will be uh, geometric. So it should involve things like orbital integrals as before. And the other one will be spectral. So it should involve characters of representations or things like that as before. So actually, Arthur uh, carry out the program for what we call the group case. So this is a case where G is the product of H with, it, with itself. And H uh, embed in G by means of the diagonal embedding. So in this case, as you may see, easily, X is just a group H. And the action of G on X is just given by left and right translations. So left for the first factor, say, and right for the second factor. And so that, that was the first case. But you also, there is also a trace formula in this case that have been sorted out. So take V to be a quadratic space and W to be some non-degenerate upper plane in it. So W is itself a quadratic space. And now you take H to be the special orthogonal group of W and G to be the product of the two special orthogonal groups. And you have a natural embedding of H into G. So on the first factor is the natural inclusion and on the second factor is just the identity. Then Valls was able to prove a trace formula in this setting and it looks like that. So there is an entity as before between this is the geometric side and this is the spectral side. And this is true only for certain function f. But OK, so on the spectral side, you have, as before, an integral over some space of conjugacy classes, which depend on h, but also on x. And you have something I call j, because this is not quite an orbital integral, but was a, a generalization of it called a weighted orbital integral. And on the other side, which is called the spectral side, you have a sum of, or was an integral over some space of representations of g, in fact, virtual representations of something like character, but these are also not quite character, but weight, weighted characters. And one remark is that here, uh, there is a main difference between this trace formula and the trace formula of Arthur that I didn't give, 
is that on the geometric side, you have really contributions from uh, conjugate singular conjugacy classes. So for example, you take the more singular conjugacy classes, which is the conjugacy classes of the identity element. It's contributing, it's, it is contributing on the left-hand side as an atom, so it means that it has its own contribution. And as an application of such a trace formula, Vatsperger was able to deduce the local gang of side conjecture, which is more precise than the Sagalaridis uh, and Venkatesh conjecture in this case, and gives a precise description of the decomposition of this space L2 of X. And <coughs> so this also works for unitary groups. And there is also a gang of conjecture in this case. But now I want to show you another case where there seems to be something that works. So this is the case of this circle variety. So GL2N over GLN times GLN. Uh, actually, I'm going to consider three different spaces. So the first one is the one I just uh, told you about. The second one is, so you take this, oh sorry, the same group G, which is still GL2N of F, but this time to change the group H. This is GLN of E, where E is a quadratic extension of F. You have a natural inclusion there. And now you keep the same H, GLN of E, but you change the group G, you take GLN of D, where D is a quaternion algebra over F. And so in these three cases, there seems to be a way to prove some at least weak trace formula. And as an application, you can prove this. Uh, so in each of these cases, define, define m of pi to be the dimension of the space of embeddings of pi into the big representation L2 of x. So this is the number of times pi appears discreetly in this L2 space. And then if pi is square integrable, uh, a square integrable representation of GL2n of f, so this is some kind of representation, and pi prime is the Jacques Langlands transfer of pi to GLN of D, uh, for those who know what it means. Then you have the following relation between the multiplicity. And uh, as an application, you get some particular case of a conjecture of Poissade and uh, Taclou. So I, I will stop there, but uh, I think there are many other cases where you can find such a trace formula with applications to the conjecture. Thank you very much.